Christ is risen. Welcome. We've got welcome to the Guild family stream. Got Phil in the chat. What's up, Phil? Uh, what's up, Paleocrat? We got Jeremiah in the stream. All right. So the E. Michael Jones content is basically Guild family stream only because um, uh, one, because we just want to produce content for the Guild members only. And two, because E. Michael Jones is very much the persona non grata uh, based on the fact that he tries to tell the truth as much as possible. And when you try to tell the truth as much as possible, you are hated and vilified as E. Michael Jones is. So if you're not familiar, uh, I would encourage everybody to subscribe to Culture Wars. This is his magazine, and this is what uh, I'm going to be reading from uh, on this. Uh, we'll talk about this. Because, well, EMG. EMJ, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, so the, the article is Synodality's Hidden Ethnic Grammar. So, um, and this is a discussion about Ratzinger's actions at the council. Now, there's a really interesting quote. The, one of his primary sources in this article is, um, is Ratzinger's um, highlights of Vatican II. What was the, is that the full? I think it's the full title of this text. So highlights of Vatican II. With jo which Joseph Ratzinger wrote right after the uh, council. Now, what's really interesting is that he actually seems to disavow any intention to rupture with the documents. Like we talked about this on, uh, I think it was part six in this series of Benedict Vindicates the Trats. So here's a quote from Ratzinger and highlights of Vatican II that uh, E. Michael Jones brings out. And he says this, Ratzinger says this, um, quote, Naturally, I took exception to certain things. So he's talking about the schemata, the original draft documents of Vatican II. But I found no grounds for a radical rejection of what was being proposed, such as many demanded later on in the council and actually managed to put through. It is true that the documents bore only weak traces of the biblical and patristic renewal of the last decades, so that they gave an impression of rigidity and narrowness through their excessive dependency on scholastic theology. In other words, they reflected more the thought of scholars than of shepherds, but I must say that they had a solid foundation and had been carefully elaborated, end quote. So I think what's really interesting here is that um, he did not have an intention to rupture, you know, because Joseph Ratzinger had a huge influence on the council, but ultimately he wasn't a bishop. And so his actions did have a massive impact, but he's disavowing the fact that there's this rupture. So this helps to prove the fact that the, the Ratzinger in 1950s and 60s is really the same Ratzinger in the 70s and 80s and 90s. He doesn't actually change his position. This is what Peter Seawald goes to great lengths in his biography to try to say there, there's a myth about Ratzinger that he was a liberal at the council and then he was a conservative later. That's not true. 